<coughs> Lawrence R. Scanlon, Jr., S-C-A-N-L-O-N, -N, better known as Larry. Uh, I'm currently the political director for AFSCME in Washington. I've been down there almost 10 years. I started with CSCA on June 3rd, 1974. I remember Tom Whitney uh, calling me up and offering me the job and said, well, you can't work in uh, Ulster County because your uncle is the local president there, but how about, how about Rockland Putnam? I said, that's great. So I went down there, actually as a field service assistant, and you served in that title. I can't remember, it was either one or two years, and then there was an automatic promotion to field rep. I think it was a year. And then uh, I was down there for about five and a half years, and uh, I can remember being at the Meany Center uh, for a program that the CSCA sent me to, and I got a call. Super Bowl Sunday, Rams Steelers, offering me the uh, school district coordinator job. So I moved up to Albany in uh, 1980, and I served in that job. Uh, I also held the education director job on a temporary basis after Tom Quimby left. I uh, served as a regional director for Region 5 when Frank Martello was down doing the Suffolk County desert. Um, I was the organizing director for about three or four years, and I was a political edge director for a number of years and ended up as the executive director uh, before I moved to AFSCME. Mm -hmm. Before we get into uh, some of your history and all of those positions, uh, do you remember when you first became aware of an organization called CSEA? Absolutely. My grandfather, James Deppy Martin, lived with us the last year before he died. This was 1967. He was then known as the chapter president for Ulster County. He was a uh, cop in the city of Kingston, retired cop. And, uh, and I'd run out to the mailbox every day in the spring looking for the thick uh, package which signaled that the college had accepted you as opposed to a thin letter where you were rejected. So um, every day I'd run out and I'd be a thick package and I'd pull it out of the mailbox and it would be something from CSEA. Well, oh, well, union stuff, right? So that's how I became acquainted with, with the union, through my grandfather. Mm, what kind of stuff was that? Do you know what that was that they were sending? It was, it was like board minutes and brochures and all, all kinds of assorted union paraphernalia. I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it because as a 17-year-old high school senior, I had other things on my mind. Okay. <laughs> you, um, so uh, you started out basically in the field uh, Correct. with uh, CSEA, and that was in the early 70s, the very early years under Taylor Law. What, uh, what, was, the, uh, what was the environment like that, uh, that you were working in, particularly, I assume, in kind of like a local government side of things? I had primarily local government. Um, I might have had one or two state stops. It was, I'm not sure if chaos is the right word, but we were an independent at the time. And, and you're correct, the Taylor Law was, went into effect in, I think it was 67. Uh, we were being raided by a number of unions. AFSCME was raiding us. Uh, uh, SCIU in particular was going after us. So we spent a lot of our time uh, in the uh, mid-70s fending off raids, also trying to do organizing at the same time. Um, I can remember what my first week on the job, I was still living in Kingston, but commuting down to Rockland County uh, trying to organize the village of uh, Slotesburg. And I was very proud of myself. I got 21 out of 23 people to sign cards and ended up losing the election 14 to 7 <laughs> because the employer committed and made some promises, et cetera. But so we we're doing organizing, we we're doing the servicing, uh, we're handling grievances, um, and then SCIU came in, and they're very active in the Hudson Valley. Uh, so we, uh, I think we beat them about 32 times straight. Uh, because at that time they were really known as a service union, a janitor's union. You know, we played up all the bad stuff that they did and, and persuaded our members to stay with us. In, in, those, um, in those places, had CSEA already been uh, recognized as the uh, bargaining agent and uh, you were uh, basically fighting off other AFL-CIO unions that were trying to decertify? Correct. Correct. And the big ones ended up being the county units that we had there. Um, they, they were really sniffing around Rockland County, which was my unit. We had about, that was about 2,500 people, um, Orange County, Dutchess County. Oh, at the same time, uh, the economy, if you remember, was not in good shape. Uh, that's when uh, Ford told the city to drop dead, uh, the bankruptcy crisis. And, and so we had a lot of hard negotiations at the time, and uh, that was sort of fodder for a union to come in and say, yeah, see, CSCA can't represent you. They can't get your raise come with us. 
We also ended up uh, about the same time going through a lot of strikes. Um, and Dutchess County was really the first county to go on strike, um, followed in pretty rapid succession by uh, Orange County, uh, Rockland County. Putnam actually didn't go on strike. We were so well organized. We had more staff there than they had deputy sheriffs that the county caved and uh, ended up agreeing to the very lucrative contract that Roger Kane had negotiated. Why, why were those strikes happening? Was it because the Taylor Law was, uh, was new and it was being tested? No, because th at that time the, these penalties were very severe under the Taylor Law. It was uh, two for one fines, um, loss of job perhaps, uh, definitely on probation. And uh, it was really the economics. I mean, and it, not, not just economics. I'll use Rockland County as an example. Uh, right after the, the problem with New York City when they went bankrupt, we were negotiating a contract in Rockland County. Phil Miller was the collective bargaining specialist. And uh, they came back with a final offer from the county against my recommendation that we not take it back. Because I, I had worked the membership. I knew what their feelings were. And they were really angry about this. So it split the unit right down the middle. They rejected the, uh, the offer and basically said, get rid of the CBS. So they turned to me and said, the leadership said, well, would you negotiate the contract? We're already, you know, at fact finding. And I said, well, I'm kind of a rookie here, but I'll do whatever you want. We ended up um, actually going to a legislative hearing under the tail law. And we packed the town hall in the town of Clarkstown. Actually, that was the night that Joe Lochner had a stroke. Uh, which was unfortunately the beginning of the end for him. And uh, we laid out our position, um, which was amply demonstrated in the facts. And of course, we got a hosing from the, uh, from the county legislature, got an imposed settlement. And Nels Carlson came in several months later, and the feelings were running so high in terms of how public workers were being treated by the politicians that you know, he had him out on strike in a, in a heartbeat. So it wasn't just economics, it was how workers were being treated. What were the challenges when you became uh, director of local government and, and school districts? What were the challenges to, uh, for that particular area? Well, actually, that, that was a very interesting time. Um, we were involved in the seminal cases in contracting out. Um, what was happening from a school district perspective was uh, transportation and food service were really being hit with the contracting out bug. The transportation in part because of the way the law and the rules and regs were structured, there was an incentive for the employer to actually contract out. And it had to do with the, the cost of the retirement system. If you were a public employer, that didn't go into the aid formula. But if you were a private employer, it did. So they got, in effect, a, a bonus for doing that. Food service was just a, a problem of trying to operate in the black. You know, you're trying to feed a lot of kids. and it's hard to make a profit doing that. So uh, we ended up, uh, there were seminal cases in, in the school districts and also in the city of Poughkeepsie uh, that went before PERB and the courts ultimately. So we spent a lot of time doing that. We also got involved at the time, um, we had a number of teacher aides. Hicksville was a great example where we had people, members who said, look, I, we organized them and then looked at their work and they weren't really aides, they were assistants. So we worked very closely with the state education department to try to basically get uh, some training and certification so that they could be licensed as teacher assistants but stay in our bargaining unit. So there was a lot of stuff happening in those few years. What was the relationship of the local government and school district side to the state side in the CSEA at that time? There was always a dynamic tension. Um, if, you go, if you go back to the late 70s, Jack Carey was running the state side and uh, Joe Dolan was running the, the local government side, and, and you had your state division, your county division. Um, and there were, part of it emanated, I think, from the way the state budget gets constructed. Um, and from a viewpoint that, that we had, which was, well, if we have to go fight one employer, the state, that it impacts on 100,000 plus workers, then uh, it's easier to, to manage that. If you have to go out and then deal with 57 counties and multiple school districts who are all dealing with aid cuts or, or lack of aid, then that gets very difficult to manage. So that was a dynamic that, that we felt everybody was competing for scarce resources. Um, back particularly in the, in the 70s when CSEA was an unaffiliated uh, union, mm -hmm. what, was, 
What was the attraction or the benefit of uh, affiliating or becoming a member of CSEA versus joining uh, one of these AFL-CIO unions? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, CSE has a very proud history. We were fiercely independent. And my heart was broken. I can remember the day we lost the, uh, the, the election for the professional scientific and technical union. In fact, we lost it in a runoff. We had won the original um, election, but the, no union was also on the ballot, so we didn't have a majority. So no union got knocked off the ballot. Then it was us and PEF. And, uh, and we lost the, the runoff. It was like uh, crushing. I mean, for all the time and effort that we had put in, you know, in terms of servicing, representing workers, um, for a unit of 60,000 people to walk away was, was pretty devastating. And a lot of the leadership, I don't remember the exact number, but an, uh, a, an inordinate amount of percentage of the leadership of CSCA came out of the professional scientific and technical units. So there was, a, in effect, a brain drain or a leadership drain when that happened. Uh, that really provided an impetus to uh, enter into serious discussions that I was not part of, but that happened with AFSCME uh, that ultimately ended up in a trial affiliation that was then cemented uh, you know, a year or two later. What do you remember about uh, that affiliation, uh, the initial, uh, the initial uh, uh, chain of events? A couple things. One is the, the, the vote at the Palace Theater when the doors were locked and they wouldn't let anybody out until they had the vote. Uh, that was pretty interesting. Uh, and also the attitude, as I said, CSCA was fiercely independent. When you think about, I mean, here's a union that had existed since 1910, um, really provided a broad range of services, very service, it was a very service intensive model in terms of working with our leadership to handle grievances, do negotiations, um, and not like the organizing model that's used today. And so, you know, you take it personally, uh, you know, when, when people say, well, we don't, like your service or we, we're ready to move on. Um, so once we became part of AFSCME, it, it was almost like uh, like a shotgun wedding. It was like, okay, we'll, we'll be part of AFSCME and, and we'll pay our per capitas, but don't, don't come into the state, don't do anything unless we ask you to do it. So I remember everything had to be channeled up through uh, President McGowan's office. Um, you couldn't have any contact with, with AFSCME without clearing it through the President's office. Now that's obviously evolved over a long period of time uh, to where we have a much closer relationship these days. Was, was there a dynamic within the uh, organization between uh, people who really believe in CSEA as a, uh, a, uh, as a trade union and others who saw it as a professional association? That was a real dynamic. I mean, the, the folks who had been around for a long time, I mean, it started out as, in effect, a professional association and sort of, um, you know, pre-Taylor law, they didn't have the right to collectively bargain. There was a lot of effort put into lobbying and legislation and trying to advance the, the cause of state workers. And then we started accreting, um, you know, local government workers, and it was a, it had a different dynamic uh, to the whole equation. Um, and then, you know, as you get into the AFL, clearly the AFL is, uh, is a trade movement. And so it was a matter of inculcating those values, uh, you know, into your leaders and into your staff to make that happen. And it, it took a long while. Um, what, uh, uh, you know, given the fact that uh, CSEA had been fighting uh, against these AFL-CIO unions and AFSCME in particular, uh, what was the dynamic for the, for the staff and activists in terms of suddenly then embracing AFSCME and becoming a part of uh, uh, the union? I would say it took probably almost a dozen years. I, and I think the change was when Joe McDermott got elected. I mean, he made a very clear decision that, you know, we're going to be part of AFSCME and we're going to, you know, pay our per capita taxes and then we really should be part of AFSCME. We should be very active in AFSCME, which was a different change from where Bill McGowan was as president. And, and maybe, you know, in hindsight, maybe, you know, Bill couldn't get there. Uh, it took a while to basically change people's attitudes. And, and the only way you do it is, is experiential. I mean, you have to work with them. So I can remember doing... Um, a, uh, a pay equity project before pay equity was in vogue with Steve Fantazzo. Uh, it was probably about 1982-83 and uh, you know, asked me to help fund that project and we went into some districts in Long Island and basically showed that there, was, uh, there wasn't pay equity. Uh, and so that was sort of the 
precursor of a lot of programs we've run today. Um, you talked about the, uh, uh, the PS&T challenge being a very significant event in the 70s that led to the ASPE affiliation. Were you directly involved in, uh, in that, uh, in that uh, DSERT fight? I was. I was assigned to the uh, psychiatric hospital in Poughkeepsie. And it was a little scary because, like I said, I didn't really have local, I had local government stops. I didn't have state stops. And uh, <coughs> you always had the feeling when you walked into a mental hygiene facility or, or a prison, you know, when they close that door, you're, you're kind of locked in with everybody else. The other part that was scary is that because it was in close proximity to Kingston, New York, where I grew up, I saw a number of clients there who I knew as citizens from Kingston. That was kind of scary. <laughs> The, um, what, what was that fight all about? Why did, uh, why did uh, they break away? Oh, you know, that's a very good question. I, I, I'd have to really sit and think. Um, it was a, PEF was a combination of the teachers and SCIU who put money in. Um, and, you know, I can't really recall a lot of the specifics. I, I'm sure it had to do with, you know, we'll give you better representation and your own union. There was something about job titles that a number of the uh, professionals felt that they weren't being properly represented at negotiations. If, if I was a, uh, you know, a, a nurse or, or a doctor that I, I was getting lumped in with everybody else and, you know, not treated according to my unique occupational concerns. Okay. Um, do you remember the, uh, the campaign to, um, to pass the uh, Public uh, Employee Safety and Health Act and uh, what kind of dynamic that took? Not a lot. I, I do recall the march where we had the coffins um, that went down Elk Street and around the Capitol. Uh, but I, I, I didn't play a major role in that. Okay. Um, how about uh, the election of Mario Cuomo uh, when uh, he beat Ed Koch in the 1982 gubernatorial primary and what kind of role CSEA played in that fight? I was not doing the politics at the time. Um, I do remember seeing bags of cash but I'll go no further on that one, um, which was legal at the time. Uh, CSEA and uh, District Council 37, in the person of both uh, Jim Featherstone Haw and Norman Adler, who were really drivers in this, um, we couldn't stomach Ed Koch. I mean, Ed Koch was running on a, a, a platform of, you know, we need to reform civil service, and his idea of reform was our idea of deform. Uh, you know, it was like a one in ten rule versus a one in three, and broadbanding and other other uh, changes. So uh, the unions got together and really plucked Cuomo out of obscurity. I mean, he, I think he might have been sitting as Secretary of State at the time. Nobody gave him a chance, uh, and he won in the primary against Koch, and and then went on to serve uh, several terms, most of which was probably contentious in terms of our relationship. It was very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get into that um, um, in a little bit. Um, tell me, because uh, uh, obviously when you, you started uh, CSEA, Ted Wenzel was uh, the president. What, uh, what do you remember about him? Dr. Wenzel. I remember the whole ball of wax. It's one of his favorite sayings. I can remember him coming down to, um, to Orange County during the strike. Uh, and we ended up, there were a whole bunch of us in a room, and he came in and, and uh, he sort of sat on the floor and he took his shoes off and he sort of flung them and very, very relaxed. A very, very well-respected man, very uh, educated man. And he moved the union forward. Um, and it, w it was probably at the same time that there was this drive to, as you referenced earlier, in terms of the trade movement, that, you know, Bill McGowan took him on and, and uh, you know, beat him by, I think it was 17 votes or thereabouts. Uh, they may still be counting those votes. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bill was a trade unionist, a blue-collar electrician out of a mental hygiene uh, institution in Western New York, and, you know, he had a different, different style about him. You know, he was a cigar-chewing, down-the-earth kind of guy, and Dr. Wenzel was a little more erudite. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about uh, Bill McGowan and how he, uh, uh, how he affected uh, uh, his or imposed his uh, personality on CSEA. Part of it was, I, I think, process of osmosis. I mean, he was, like I say, very unpretentious guy, very down to earth, uh, guy you could, you know, knock back a beer with and have a hot dog and, he, you know, that's, that was his diet. Uh, he was very good to me. I mean, I, I was promoted uh, into headquarters um, 
under his watch. Uh, I can remember when Tom Quimby left uh, to take over at Cornell, um, President McGowan called me up and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to combine the two jobs, uh, school district coordinator and education director, uh, can you do it? And I said, yeah, if that's what you want, sure. Um, so I did it for a while, and then they had the, for, it was probably six months, then they had the interviews for the position. So in the middle of the interview, uh, I said to him, now you're still going to combine these two jobs, right? And he goes, nah, he says, I, I changed my mind, uh, I'm really going to keep them separate. So I said, so this is the interview for the education director? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, i got to be honest with you. I, I, I really don't want to be the education director. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, I'd like to be the organizing director. And he said, well, we don't have an organizing department. And I said, well, we should talk about that. So then we sat there for another hour, and I just laid out some of my ideas. And he said, well, put it on paper, which I ultimately did. Um, and that was a time when the politics, internal politics, started to get a little contentious. Um, Joe McDermott, who was uh, region president, vice president, uh, had challenged Tom McDonough, and then Tom McDonough had died after he was reelected, and, and Joe became the executive vice. Clearly, had ambitions to be the president. Um, I am told there was an understanding that Bill was going to step down, but then Bill sort of felt he was being pushed, so he didn't step down. He ran again in 1985, and uh, and so the, everything was caught up in a swirl. Joe had, at that time, he had a lot of um, support on the board. He really had the votes on the board. And so he basically crafted a, um, a reorganization plan. And everybody agreed at the time that we really need to have an organizing department. We never had one. I mean, when I started, there were several uh, folks who were statewide organizers, but they were they would do some organizing, but many times they were an extra pair of hands filling in on vacation, sick leave, or strike, whatever. Um, and so we really had no concerted approach to organizing. They created the, the, the department and the position, and I interviewed for the job. I remember Ellis Adams was chair of the committee, personnel committee. And he gave me, in effect, a softball. He said, well, okay, well, if you were the organizing director, what would you do? And I'm thinking, well, this is my plan. I, you know, I laid out chapter and verse, and all the heads were nodding. And best interview I ever did in my life. All right, I came out. I didn't get the job. <laughs> McGowan hired Lee Frank because Lee was, you know, the regional director out in the, in the West, and and you know, Lee was a big, gruff, tough guy, and sort of the, the idea of an organizer to plant gates that you know can intimidate people and get them to sign. So he lasted about a year. Uh, and, the, and again, the board was up in arms the way he was doing business, and, and McDermott had the vote. So ultimately, they, um, they uh, defunded the position, along with the executive director at the time, which was Bernie Zwinak. Now he, and at that point, he was only the third executive director. We had Joe Lochner for 40-plus years, and then Joe Dolan for a short period of time, and Zwinak lasted uh, maybe a year. So they reorganized, and... Uh, and I was appointed the organizing director. I, I think I actually have about six appointment letters to the same job. Where I was the organizing director, then I was the deputy director for organizing, then I was the temporary organizing director, then I was the temporary, temporary deputy director for organizing. All this is being played out in the courts here. You know, my name and salary being splashed on the front page of the Albany Times Union, which mortified my wife. Um, and ultimately, the courts held for McGowan and under the CSEA Constitution that all the staff reported to the president. So it overturned McDermott's uh, board motion that said that all the staff report to the president through the vice president. So ended up then doing the organizing for several years and we, d we did a lot of work at that point going into the private sector because New York is pretty heavily penetrated in terms of public sector organizing and there were, you know, along with the privatization, we wanted to follow the work, so we ended up organizing a lot of people in the private sector, including St. Lawrence University, which was one of our earliest forays. As you're, as you're indicating, um, the McGowan-McDermott uh, fight was a very tumultuous uh, time. As you look back on it 20 years later, what was it all about? What did it really all amount to? Uh, I think you had two very strong-willed personalities who had visions of what should be done with the union. Um, from a staff perspective, you, you know, you tried to keep your head down and just keep to your work. Um, but of 
course, you know, you get caught up in some of the politics. It was the first time that I, I saw some politicization of the staff, um, particularly the top staff around McGowan who were, you know, viewing the world through political eyes instead of through operational eyes. Uh, and that's understandable, I mean, uh, based on what was going on. Uh, and I, I, you know, I was the organizing director at the time, and I'm, I was just trying to do my job, uh, trying to organize new members for the union. Um, McGowan had a lot of support among the staff because th it was a, an older staff, an aging staff. That's probably not a good way to put it, but long-term veterans uh, who had come up through the ranks. So he enjoyed a lot of support, and, you know, Joe came out of the region, so he had less of a base to work with. So there was, a, you know, just a handful of us who, you know, kind of liked some of the ideas that McDermott had. Although the first time I met him, I, I didn't like him. I mean, I, Tom Kumi and I went out to meet with him and Jack Corcoran talk about some training, and we, we le both left the meeting going, well, oh, this is, was not a good meeting. Um, I really got to know him uh, when I had to do the staff negotiations with him in, I think it was 1985, uh, the year that the staff was on strike, and uh, we got locked up in a hotel room. So I, I came to know him a little better. Very bright guy, um, very opinionated, you know, how he wanted to do things, uh, but you could sometimes move him on issues when you had to. So um, McDermott becomes the, uh, the president of CSEA and you become the uh, political action director. What did you know about political action at that time? Well, you know, I, we, I knew something. I always follow politics. I like politics. Um, and I can remember using, when Tom Haley was a political director, I'd have him come down trying to leverage, like in Rockland County, leverage our politics to, to get things done for our members. But um, the... Uh, Feathers had really pushed for the political action uh, trustees, as, uh, and this was, I think, 1983, perhaps, where they first formalized our political structure. And uh, so it was only a f about five years old, and they had been through a couple of uh, directors. Uh, Bernie Ryan was, I think, the first political director, and he sort of ran afoul of some people and got fired, and, and then Tom Haley was the next director, and Bob... Haggerty was there as an assistant director. He ran afoul of a couple of folks, and he ended up leaving. And Tom Haley came. He said, I'm, I'm going to retire. He said, I'm going to open up a B&B. &B. And I thought to myself, well, you know, interesting job, but I wanted to find more about it. So I can remember being in New York City talking to Danny Donahue and Bob Latimer, who were trustees on the Political Action Fund, and kind of quizzing them about how it worked and whatever. And based on that conversation, I decided I really didn't want to be the political director. Uh, so I'm just doing my business, and then Joe McDermott gets elected in 1988, and he called me from, I think the convention was in Anaheim, and he asked me to serve as the uh, chair of the transition team. I said, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. And he said, and I'd like you to be the political ledge director. And I said, well, I don't want to do that. And he said, we'll talk. So when he came back, um, we sat down, and every day I'm in his office several times a day, you know, going over transition stuff. and. He'd say, when are you going to that downstairs? Because political action was on the first floor. I said, I'm not going downstairs. I don't want that job. And he said, I need you to do it. I said, I don't want to do it. So finally he said, well, what the, what's the hang up? Why don't you do this? I said, look, in order to be successful at that job, in my opinion, I said, you know, you got to hang out over there with those guys. You got to eat with them, drink with them. I said, you know, I don't want to do that. I, you know, my marriage room survive. It's not worth it. I don't he said, what if I hire you a lobbyist? I, uh, I said, finally, look. I'll never forget, it was my mother's birthday, August 8th, 1988. I said, I will, I'll take the job, but it'll just be a temporary job, right? That I will uh, um, go down there, we'll straighten it up, and we make some staff changes, do all that stuff, and then I'll go back to the organizing. And he goes, yeah, that's a deal. So I was sitting there five years later in this temporary job, when he came to me and, and said, I want to talk to you about the executive director's job. And I said, leave me alone. I'm 10 days out from a presidential election. I don't have time to talk about that. And so he laughed and then said, okay, we'll have breakfast afterwards. And so that's how I got into the political department, against my better judgment. Now, uh, the time uh, during which you served as uh, director of political action were a very difficult uh, time for uh, CSEA and for the state of uh, New York. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the environment at that uh, time, and yep. particularly with a, with a governor who... Uh, we had helped elect, but uh, wasn't particularly friendly to CSEA. We helped them elect them in 82. Uh, and my recollection, that was the year that, that in the general, um, 
the guy that owned Rite Aid, Herb. It's, uh, Lou Lehrman. Lou Lehrman ran. If that election had gone on probably another week, Lehrman probably would have been the governor. I mean, he was, Cuomo was really sliding at the end and, and, and hung on to win. Then he ran in 86, and I think he ran against, I want to say Spano. I think it was the Westchester County executive. Anyway, it was, right, it yeah, it was O'Rourke. O'Rourke. O'Rourke, and it wasn't much of a race. Um, and then I got appointed, as I said, August 8th, 1988. I, I think it was, it was like two weeks later that Dahl Forsyth, who was the budget director for Cuomo, came out with a, what they call the call letter. And he basically said, we're about $2 billion in the hole. All right, now, making up $2 billion is not easy. And we got involved in some very contentious exchanges uh, with the Cuomo administration because they're looking to, <coughs> you know, cut jobs and cut salaries and furloughs. And, and then the worst thing was they tried to go after the pension system. And they had this harebrained idea called PUC. And it's projected unit credit. And what they wanted to do was change the, basically the way they calculated the, the pension payments. So uh, it w would project off into the future the costs. And we said, look, we're not getting pucked. No way, no how. Uh, we ended up, Joe and I went over um, and we met with, um, with Drew Zambelli. No, I'm sorry, with Jerry Crotty. Jerry Crotty was the Secretary of Administration for Cuomo at the time. We went in, loaded for bear. He said, no. He says, the governor agrees with you guys. Puck is off the table. It's a dead issue. Right? Great. And then two days later, we see it's out in bill form. Uh, ultimately, um, my th if my recollection is right, they passed it, we sued, and we won on it. Um, but it, And then relations with Cuomo really went downhill after that. Um, we're, and the budget got worse. I mean, in the next couple of years, they're talking about $5 billion in the hole. And uh, so we got to the, to the election in 94 when he decided he was going to run for a fourth term, which is very, very difficult uh, for any governor. And, you know, when you look at, at the way the, the economy was going and budget deficits and all that kind of stuff, um, we had no contract. Um, and, and we couldn't get a contract. And we had some very unpleasant previous experiences with Cuomo because in 92, our union endorsed Bill Clinton for president. Um, and it happened on the day when Cuomo had to make a decision whether he was going to run for president. And if you remember those years in, in that whole cycle, it was he was like Hamlet on the Hudson. Should I run? Should I not run? I don't know. What do I do? And they literally had the plane on the tarmac at the Albany County Airport revved up waiting for the $500 check, the filing fee for New Hampshire. So the day that this is going on, we had decided, we had leaked our endorsement of, uh, of Bill Clinton. So all the satellite trucks were ringing the Capitol. And the big news and the headlines in the Albany Times Union the next day were, uh, state employees union slaps governor in the face, endorses little-known southern governor, uh, which he didn't take too kindly to. So we had all that, you know, leading up into the 94 election, and uh, we had no contract, right? Uh, Russ Hanna was negotiating the contract. We were, I don't know, probably 18 months beyond the expiration. Things were not going anywhere. The zero was on the table. And, uh, and they were looking for our support. And we said, eh. So Dave Weinrob flew out to our convention, which was in Rochester that year. And this was probably a, you know, a month out from the election. And we had not endorsed. And he said, what will it take? And I said, three fives. He goes, ah, I don't know if I can get three fives. I said, yes, what it'll take? That's what it's going to take, three fives. We want a contract. So he goes back, and then he calls me. He says, well, I got one five and a four and a half, and the other one's either a four and a half or a five. I'm not sure. I said, well, wrap it up and let me know. Then I get a subsequent phone call a couple hours later, no deal. And I said, do you know what this means? He goes, yeah, I know what it means. You know what it means. But they, meaning Cuomo and his advisors, don't know what it means. They're concerned about, you know, the perception, the public perception that they're caving to the unions and whatever. I said, well, he's going to lose the election, you know, because we're not going to endorse. And we didn't endorse. And he did lose the election to George Pataki, mm -hmm. a little-known assemblyman senator from Westchester County. Why did the, uh, to go back to Cuomo, why did uh, the relationship with him deteriorate considering how much C had, CSEA had done in the first place to help get him get, you know, help him get elected? That's a very good question, very interesting question. I, I'm not sure if I know the answer, although Mario Cuomo is a very brilliant man, and uh, he'll tell you that. I mean, he has a 
pretty high regard for himself. And I don't mean that in a bad fashion. I mean, that's just who he is. Uh, I mean, I can remember we were in Lake Placid for a CSCA event, and we got this panic phone call, you've got to be down at the Capitol. Russ Han and I had to drive back from Lake Placid. So we get there after everybody else, and we walked into the Cuomo, and there's the governor's office in the corner, and there's a big uh, anteroom that has a, it's funereal. It's got these huge dark blue drapes, and it was drawn shut, long table, no chairs around it. So we get in late, so I'm sitting at the head of the table, and Russ is right here, and all the other labor lobbyists are lined up in these chairs. And then Cuomo comes in, and he's at the far end of the table, and he must be, I don't know, 30 feet from me. And he starts talking about the budget deficit and what are we going to do and we have revenues and I need some help. And, and there was no response from any of the labor lobbyists. So me being me said, well, Governor, I think maybe we need to raise taxes. Well, he went off like a Roman rocket. Started screaming and yelling. And that's why we're in this trouble in the first place, raising taxes, losing business. Blah. So he got done. And I, I'm watching all the labor lobbyists. They're all pushing their chairs away from the table. So I'm sitting there like, you know, one-on-one -on -one with Cuomo. And I said to him, well, you asked me for my opinion, and here's my opinion. We ought to raise taxes. Then he went off on another tirade. So that's the kind of guy he was. I mean, he just, he was very opinionated, very smart. Uh, he had a vision of what he wanted to accomplish. Uh, he, he had, as you know, a, a history of calling up reporters at 5 or 6 in the morning and, and engaging in a tirade against them for articles they had written, right? So that's just the way he was. What was, his, what was the dynamic of his relationship with McGowan? You know, I don't know the answer to that because I didn't really travel in, in that okay. circle at the time. Well, then, then take it to uh, McDermott. Uh, how, how did the, the two of them get along? Oh, uh, pretty much like oil and water. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joe was very smart and opinionated, and Mario was smart and opinionated, so they, there was a lot of clash. Okay. Um, I mean, you talked about, uh, you know, the, the contract fight. Do you remember um, the hot day in February and how that uh, <laughs> came about and what uh, Boy, you know, do what I. That I, I that, that's indelibly etched in my brain. I can remember when we first started talking about it, I was like, no, no, we don't really want to do this. I mean, the logistics or whatever, we'll do something. No, no, we, we're going to have a small demonstration. I said, but what if we can't get enough people? I mean, you know, we'll work on it. So then... You know, we put the call out, and we start. You know, we we told people you got to write in and tell us how many buses you're bringing, and you know, and we thought there was a lot of fluff in the numbers, and we thought we'd have maybe five or seven thousand people. Well, the numbers kept coming in, and Ed Laplante, uh, who was my uh, deputy in political action at the time, he kept every day saying, "Wait, more buses, more buses." And I said, "This is growing out of control here," and uh, we ended up. I think there was like twenty-five thousand people. It was. A magnificent sight. First of all, we were in the, we, we rallied in the armory, and the armory it, it felt like it was about 130 degrees there. And McDermott was up on the stage, and Joe Puma and some other folks, and uh, you know, giving the speeches and get people fired up. And then we marched. In the meantime, the Albany police were berserk because we said we figured we'd have five to seven thousand people, and there was like 25,000 people. The Albany was like gridlock, and this massive piece of humanity marched. You know, down Washington Avenue, snaked around the Capitol. At one point, it, it sort of bifurcated, like a, like a snake's tongue, and then came back together. We, and we ended up marching over to the governor's mansion, and we had a flatbed truck, and we're pounding on the gates, and we're yelling and screaming, and it was one of the best things we ended up doing ever doing. I mean, but from the from the get go, it was like I'm not sure if we want to do this, but it was immensely successful. And the best part was. We got everybody home except one guy missed his bus, and we ended up having to fly him back to somewhere in western New York. But everybody else, we got back to their buses, which were parked over in Lincoln Park. I mean, it was, it was amazing. Did it, did it have an impact on the governor? Well, you like to think it had an impact on the governor. I mean, to, to have that many people show up and protest and say, hey, you know, you're not being fair to us. Um, but with the governor, you never know. It did, did ultimately uh, lead to a resolution of the, the contract, yeah. right? Yep. That. The um, what what would you um, how, how would you look at uh, the Joe McDermott uh, administration and uh, look at what uh, Joe McDermott's uh, legacy uh, is for CSEA? Uh, Joe had a his vision of, of the union um, was to really try to instill. 
uh, a lot of more professionalism in how things were done. And, and he was also noted for being, I don't want to say tight-fisted, because I love Joe McDermott, but he was, he was very cautious with the money. Um, and he was very concerned. Uh, you know, we had a fight at one of the conventions to, um, to change the due structure. Uh, and part of the fight was really when the money came in, that the per caps and everything were paid first, and then the locals got the rebate on the remainder, which was a change. And that, that didn't go over too well with the locals. But he used his political capital, you know, to get that done. Um, that was, if I remember correctly, that was in Lake Placid, the, the year we had the early snowstorm, and it just it was a blizzard. Everything was paralyzed up there. We were sleeping without heat and light. It was kind of interesting. But he, he really moved the union forward. Um, he was very involved, for example, I mentioned, you know, the puck issue, but uh, we also got involved in, he was chair of the first uh, pension advisory committee for the AFL-CIO, and he took a very active role in that. And in terms of driving how we do investments and, and also using money, and I don't want to say social investments, but it was, it was good investments that had a social impact as well. We got involved with, uh, with the mortgage program, you know, looking to basically free up some pension money uh, to allow people with lower incomes or, or their credit wasn't quite right uh, more liberal terms to get a mortgage. I mean, that was, I think, a very uh, significant accomplishment. So yeah, he did a lot of good things, I thought, as president of the union. Um, one, one of the significant, uh, from an internal perspective, I think, especially um, uh, things that he did and uh, that was during your time uh, as well, uh, uh, political action, was to get uh, the local government agency shop uh, legislation uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, that and uh, the difficulty in I making can. that happen? I can. There's a story, and I don't know how true it is, that that Feathers had cut the deal. Uh, remember now, the Republicans had controlled the Senate for something like 99 out of the last 100 years. And um, so you had to do business with the Senate Republicans. And supposedly Feathers had, had cut the deal, but when the blow-up came, which I think was 1986, when, uh, when McGowan and his folks said, well, we're, we're going to get rid of the law firm, um, which was a real big split in the unit at the time, that, that deal disappeared. So McGur McDermott got elected in 88, and he said, oh, that was the other thing when, when I took the job. He said, I said, okay, well, you know, other than like restructuring new staff, what do you want to get done? And he said, I want local government agency shop. <laughs> I said, thank you very much, Joe. I, you give me an impossible task here. Anyway, we set about, you know, we started um, uh, lining up our votes, and uh, Jim Lack, who was a se Republican senator from uh, Long Island, was very, very helpful. Uh, Nick Spano, Republican senator from uh, Westchester County, very helpful. And ultimately, Joe and I, we drove down to Long Island, and we went out to Ralph Marino's office, and we basically made the deal in terms of agency shop. And the Republicans were very concerned about redistricting and losing control of the Senate, which they've had, as I said, for 99 years. And we had a lot of Republican friends, and we support a lot of Republicans, so we said, you know, we'll be there with you. So we, uh, we went into session, and at that time, Kenny Shapiro was our lobbyist. And I remember being uh, at the AFSCME convention in Miami, and right at the end of the convention, Kenny calls and said, well, the, the Republicans are ready to move the bill. I said, good. He says, well, I'm not sure. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I, I, I don't know if we have the Democratic votes. I said, wait a minute. You, you came out of the assembly. You're friends with Mel Miller, the, the speaker. I mean, he said, yeah, we should be able to do it. He said, but I, I don't know if Cuomo will sign it. I said, what do you mean? You he goes, hey, you know, he's had a bad relationship with you guys, and there's no commitment there. And I said, okay, pull the bill. And he said, you sure? I said, yeah, pull the bill. We'll, we'll take another run at it. So two years later, now I'm in Nevada at the AFSCME convention. It's always bad timing. And uh, Tom Hartnett was our chief lobbyist. And we had, again, wired it up. And we, you know, we knew we had so many Republican votes that they would deliver. And he called me. He was on the phone with Jim Lack. And he said, uh, well, we got a little glitch. And I went, oh, not again. What is it? He said, well, the Senate Democrats are saying that um, they're not going to vote for the bill. And why? Well, they think we should have permanent agency shop. I said, yeah, I, and I should be a millionaire. I said, run the bill. He said, you sure? I said, yeah. I said, they can't afford to vote against us. So they ran the bill, 
we got 19 or 20 Republican votes, and uh, and we we passed it, and that's how we ended up getting local government agents to shop. The, you you uh, referenced earlier the fact that uh, you thought that uh, Joe McDermott did an awful lot to really solidify uh, CSEA's uh, presence in uh, AFSCME. Can you talk a little bit more about what some of the things were that he did to bring uh, CSEA more fully into the um, AFSCME orbit? Well, if you recall, he um, the CSEA was really the deciding votes um, when McEntee got elected after the death of Jerry Wirth. Um, and I don't know all the intimate details, but I know that McDermott was, was uh, supportive of McEntee and obviously looking out towards an eye towards the institutional interest of CSEA. And so when he assumed the presidency, I mean, he had been active, he had become a vice president of AFSCME, but clearly he saw the role that, that CSEA should play within AFSCME. And we were the largest affiliate that AFSCME had by far, right? By almost probably about a two to one margin over uh, DC 37. So he said, you know, we need to flex our muscles and, you know, we should be helping drive policy and decision making. So he played a much bigger role and he, he had a pretty good relationship with. Uh, with McEntee, although at times, you know, there'd be some yelling and screaming, but that's natural in this business. And uh, so he really, he really brought AFSCME, he really brought CSEA in through the AFSCME family. Um, I've asked this of other uh, folks too. Um, how do you think CSEA has changed AFSCME and how do you think AFSCME has changed CSEA? Oh, that's a tough question. I think CSEA being active in AFSCME has really helped expand uh, CSEA's worldview that we're n just not a New York State Union, but because of our clout and size and, and a lot of the programs. I mean, you know, we should be very proud of, of what CSEA has accomplished over the years. I mean, very progressive union on a lot of issues, a leader compared to even some of the national unions, and, and we're bigger than a lot of the national unions. So, but by playing with an AFSCME, you saw the bigger scope there, like the, particularly the national politics and the national, you know, dealing with Congress with legislation. That that you were in a period, um, you know, we went through the the 80s and the 90s and very difficult years because the, the feds were devolving government, right? So, a lot of the, the responsibilities are being pushed back on the states. The, there were budget issues uh, that are out there. So, I think that really helped. CSCA's worldview. From an AFSCME perspective, it is the largest affiliate. I mean, CSCA can throw their weight around saying we think we ought to be going in this direction or, or that direction. So part of it is, is mental uh, in terms of what you have to offer in terms of programs. Part of it is financial. I mean, there's a lot of dues money that, that goes into AFSCME that helps drive program. So it's been a very, I think, a real symbiotic relationship. Um, you, you talked a little bit about um, endorsement of Bill Clinton, mm -hmm. um, uh, primarily in the context of uh, uh, the relationship with Mario Cuomo, but um, certainly if you look at the Clinton endorsement, uh, CSEA did it before AFSCME did it, and so it became a very significant event for both the international and for uh, CSEA in the way it worked out. What were yep. some of the origins of how that uh, actually happened in terms of the, uh, the relationship uh, established with Clinton uh, that led to the endorsement? Uh, it was a very interesting process. I happened to have been at an Ask Me board meeting when they brought in the candidates uh, to interview them. And there was uh, Clinton showed up, Tom Harkin showed up, Bob Kerry showed up. Uh, Doug Wilder, Jerry Brown, and Songus did not show. And I can remember, I, and I was, you know, as a staff person, I was just standing in the back. And um, Harkin came in first. And, you know, Harkin's a good labor guy. We had a very close relationship with him. And, he sort of laid out his plan and fumbled a little bit like, well, you know, who, who are you hiring? Is your staff? What's your fundraising? But great on the issues. Bob Kerry came in, nice presentation. And Bob said, uh, you know, he was talking about, if I remember correctly, national health care. And every answer was, well, we need national health care. Okay, well, how about our, like, missile defense, whatever? No, if we had national health care, we'd be able to afford missile defense. You know, those kinds of, so people are, mm. Bill Clinton came in. And I'll never forget, I mean, this guy worked the room. And then when he spoke, he said, here's what I'm going to talk about. Then he talked about it. 
And they said, now here's what I just talked about. I mean, you know, the, your quintessential teaching tool, right? Three times. Then he worked the entire table. And I said, boy, this guy's got it. Now, I had seen him speak before. Uh, Joe and I and Bob Latimer, we had gone down to the DLC meeting in, uh, in uh, Louisiana in, I don't know, 90 or 91, and he was very impressive. I mean, and I remember seeing him speak at the convention where it was like, it had to be about the worst convention, Democratic convention speech I've ever seen. It was like you wanted to reach to the TV screen and grab the guy and just yank him off the stage. And it was a great disappointment because I had heard him speak before that and he was very good. So uh, we, uh, he clearly had won over the board. Um, the problem at the time was that there was an AFL rule that said that they tried to build consensus with their endorsement and only f upon failing to reach consensus would individual national unions be allowed to make endorsements. So I'm sure, as I'm sitting here, and I don't have the proof, but a scheme was hatched between uh, Jerry McEntee and Joe McDermott saying, hey, well, you guys aren't a national union, but clearly you're a major union, you're a big force, big political force. If you endorse, that's a clear signal where we're going. And I think that's how the endorsement came about. Uh, Mike Moran and I got called into Joe McDermott's office, and Joe said, hey, let me try something out on you. What do you, th what do you think we, how about endorsing Bill Clinton? And Mike and I just looked at him and said, yeah, let's go, baby. And then Joe said, he goes, oh, we probably ought to ask Ross because he's negotiating with Cuomo. Uh, as I said earlier, Cuomo was debating whether he was going to run. So Ross came in. And we, we were in the conference room next to the president's office, and, and Joe lays this out. And then Ross looks at me, and he looks at Moran, and he goes, well, you guys have already decided this, and I'm going to get my lights punched out here by Cuomo. But yeah, oh, sure, let's do it. So that's how we ended up making the endorsement. What, what did, in the retrospect, what did that mean for CSEA? Well, what it means is Clinton has never forgot that um, that CSCA was first out of the box, not only out of the box in terms of endorsing, but we sent people over to New Hampshire. Uh, we sent staff over to New Hampshire. We had volunteers. Uh, we had van loads of people come from uh, uh, other union, other AFSCME unions, the DC 37, 1707. We sent people to Michigan, which was an early primary state at the time. Um, so he, he got a lot of support. They, he had been here. It was in one of his first trips into Albany at St. Rose. Uh, he came in, and Hillary was flying in from somewhere else, and she was a little delayed, so we were waiting. And they made a joint appearance, uh, and I believe this was, I, I think it was after New Hampshire, but I'm not positive. It could have been just before it, um, but it was one of the first times that they were really together on the campaign trail. Did a great job, obviously, speaking to the audience. and uh, So it really, I think, vaulted CSCA. Uh, I mean, everybody knows that CSCA was the first union out to endorse Bill Clinton. Um, come back to another uh, figure in that kind of that same time frame, and that's Carl McCall. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, uh, was appointed as uh, the uh, state controller. Um, CSEA shortly thereafter joined with him in a lawsuit uh, uh, over another attempt to raid uh, the pension system, and he stood up to uh, Cuomo. Did that really uh, solidify the relationship between CSEA and Carl McCall? Yeah, we always had a good relationship with Carl, but he certainly was a, a stand-up guy you know, on the pension stuff, and, uh, and we had been fighting, and, and Ned Regan had done actually a good job as comptroller um, in terms of our relationship with him, but when the, when the system started to get really flush, he was basically giving rate decreases to all the employers, and we said, well, wait a minute, what? we got people paying 3% of their salary, I mean, we got to do something for folks as well, and, and he wouldn't do that, um, and he moved on, and actually, it was interesting because just before that, uh, Carol Bellamy, um, I'm trying to remember, she, she held some kind of financial position. We backed her uh, in the run for comptroller, and we thought we had her elected. Uh, it was a very close race, and uh, she worked very hard. And she actually outpolled Cuomo in, I think, 23 of the 26 upstate counties. And we, we were all over for her, and she'll never forget that. Um, and we were in, down in, in New York for the vote count, and the numbers were coming in. We went, wow, this is great. I mean, um, you know, these are, these are uh, like upstate numbers, and the city comes in later, so we're going to win big. Well, and that was usual practice, but as it turned out, it wasn't. The early numbers were the city numbers, and 
even though she won some of the counties upstate, it wasn't enough to, to offset like Erie County. So she lost by a very narrow margin. We've always had a great interest because New York has a sole trustee for the pension system. Immense power. And it was sort of the precursor to what's going on now in terms of activism by unions in terms of pension fund investments and leveraging your, your pension monies to get done what you have to get done. And I think Carl was really on the cutting edge of that. When he ran for re-election, CSEA really formed the backbone of his uh, election uh, uh, campaign. Uh, what uh, uh, you know, what uh, went on in that uh, particular fight, if you remember? Well, one thing I remember was we were not happy with the way the campaign was being structured uh, and run. And we had a meeting at a restaurant over here, and uh, we basically said to him, "If you don't, we're going to put some of our people in to help run this thing, and if." If you if you don't run it the right way, we're pulling out. We can't afford this. And he said, no, no, I, I understand. And they shaped up the campaign, and, and he won it. We, we've had to do that with, with a number of electeds where um, they are not – they're good campaigners, but they don't have a good campaign operation. And we think it's our responsibility, if we're going to endorse somebody, to get them elected, not just give them a paper endorsement. So we put staff – we did the same thing with Maurice Hinchy when he first ran uh, for Congress. And the campaign was muddled, and we had, had put a staff person in. And he said, I said, if you don't get a campaign manager, we're pulling everything out. He said, no, no, I, I understand. I, I got problems. And Eleanor Nash Brown came in. And so I think from a union perspective, you know, when you commit money marbles and chalk, you've got to be serious about it. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you see Carl McCall cultivate his relationship with CSEA? A couple of ways. One is that he had an excellent relationship with his staff people. I mean, they really liked him, and he was a genuine person. And he's held a number of positions. I mean, he comes from an interesting background, uh, and, you know, he was UN ambassador and school board chancellor or whatever the title was. I mean, he, he really is a man of many talents, but, but he really had a feel for the, for the common working person, and that's very impressive. Um, you, you've uh, mentioned uh, earlier that uh, besides yourself, there have really only been three executive directors in uh, CSEA's history. What is particularly challenging about uh, being uh, the executive director of CSEA? Well, uh, it's, a, it's a interesting. As you know, staff members, people who work for the union, are not union members. So I've never been a CSEA member. And there was always this dynamic tension between the elected leadership and the staff leadership. Um, and there was some sort of, uh, maybe some resentment. Um, you know, people said, well, I'm elected to an office and I'm elected by the members and I ought to be leading the union, which we agree with. We said, from a staff perspective, our job is to make sure that the union functions. Um, so there was always that, um, you know, and Joe Dolan was a pretty large personality. Um, Joe Lochner had been around a long time. I mean, he was the union for a long time. I think it was himself and a, and a clerical basically when it started. I mean, and he built quite an operation. Uh, Bernie Zwinak came in from the outside uh, from a federal union, had really no understanding of what CSCA was all about, um, and he didn't last long. I came up through the union. I mean, I, I, I had served, uh, I don't know, 18, 20 years at the time. And I, I always viewed myself as someone to get things done. Um, I had no desire to be out front, you know, to be like an elected. So I think it worked very well that way that, you know, Joe was the elected president and, and he was very hands-on. And I was sort of, you know, behind the scenes making sure that, that the trains run on time. What, um, I mean, well, what is uniquely challenging about CSEA in terms of uh, trying to uh, in terms of trying to move an agenda forward, what, what are the, the real challenges of that? Well, the, you have, there's physical challenges uh, in terms of, first of all, it's a huge state. I mean, when you talk to people, and I, I travel through the country a lot, and I'll say, oh, yeah, I'm originally from New York, and they'll say New York City, and I'll say, no, I'm from Kingston, New York, which is 90 miles north of the city. It's like in another planet. And the further you go upstate, it's really different. I mean, it, it's a beautiful state, but it's, it's huge in its dimension. Uh, it's varied in its social and economic classes. Um, we have 
at the time, I think we had about a thousand contracts that we were responsible for negotiating. Um, we were in every county. Uh, we had the state workers who were dispersed all over the state. You know, you have, you know, a little DOT barn in, in an area that's off by themselves, but they deserve the same kind of representation that a, you know, a thousand people at the you know, central ISO site deserve. So, you know, it, it, the logistics of getting that done w was amazing. Um, big staff. I mean, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I'm going to guess that we had like 400 staff people. And a lot of them were decentralized at a headquarters. They're all place. So you're trying to manage staff. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to build um, a spirit de corps, uh, which was hard at times because there, there was a staff union that had been on strike several times. And I was in the staff union. I was on strike. I was a strike leader. I was the grievance steward. Uh, I was on negotiating teams. In fact, I was about to run for vice president of, of the union, the staff union, when I got uh, promoted out of the bargain unit. Now, I'm su not that I'm suggesting there's anything nefarious in that, but so it's it is a challenge. I mean, it's uh, you have any range of different occupational titles, you know, thousands of them all over the board, um, and you know the job is you do this because you want to help people improve their lives. And that's why you work for a union. And there's a lot of lives out there to improve. Um, as you went through your career in CSEA, were there things that surprised you about the organization that uh, kind of like caught you uh, uh, unexpected, you know, uh, you were sort of like not expecting uh, to discover certain things at different times? Strange play. I, when I started, um, I, I literally went from my house into the field. I never had any training or orientation. Um, we finally got called up, Quimby and I, and I think it was George Cinco, um, to headquarters, and we, we got our, our briefcase, which was very large, and when you pack stuff, it was very heavy. We got uh, an old, like a Victor adding machine. It was a huge calc or calculator. It was like one of the precursors to what we have today. And we got a civil service law book, and that was it. And our, our parting shot was we got called into uh, to Joe Lochner's office, and he said, I have two things to tell you. So we're on the edge of our seat waiting for this man of wisdom to talk to us, and he said, number one, don't cheat on your expense accounts. Number two, sell that insurance. And I sat back and said, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? Because <laughs> I had no interest in insurance. Well, it turns out, obviously, we had a very um, I didn't know at the time, lucrative, but also very good insurance program for our members. Um, but I was more interested in, in social justice, and I was coming, I was a, a child of the 60s and, you know, out marching against the Vietnam War, and there was race riots and the civil rights and all that stuff, so I wanted to change the world. I wasn't worried about selling insurance, so that was sort of a splash of cold water in my face. But once you get out there, you know, working with the members, it was a blast. I mean, they're just great people, and you, know, and you, you feel fulfilled when you're out there and you negotiate a contract, or you, you win a grievance, you save a job. I mean, Thelma Kaiser sticks in my mind, a woman that was a Civil Service Commission employee, actually, who they tried to fire illegally. We saved her job. And I can remember one of my unit presidents, Norma Condon, calling me up one day and said, the superintendent wants to see me. What should I do? Uh, I said, well, what does he want to talk to you? She's about the contract. Well, I said, well, go see him. She said, well, what if he makes me an offer? I said, well, you know, don't make any commitments, but take it in and give me a call. So she goes in, an hour later she calls me, she says, he just offered me three-year contract, 10% a year. I'm going to take it. I said, no, no. I said, does that include increments or is that plus increments? She goes, oh, I don't know. I said, well, go back in and tell him it's 10% plus increments, right? She says, can I do that? I said, yeah, go do that. So she goes in and he says, yeah, of course. So that, that negotiation was done in an hour, one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, to the benefit of our members, all right? So, you know, it's all those anecdotes. When you look back, uh, when I first decided I was going to go into the union uh, movement, it was I wanted to, to leave my footprint in concrete, not sand, right? I, to make a difference in the world. And I, the union movement has allowed me to do that. And I can look back and see how, and not just me, uh, a lot of people have really made a difference in people's lives. And, that's what it's all about. Why do you think CSEA has been able to endure for 100 years? I think they've had good leadership. I think they've had a, a, a democratic union. 
Uh, it's one of the few ones where members actually vote for their statewide officers. You know, a lot of unions have elect delegates who go to conventions and elect officers, but CSEA is a direct democracy, which is something I hope they keep. I mean, it's a pain in the butt at times to administer, and people argue, well, only 20, 25 percent of people vote, but hey, 100 percent have the opportunity to vote, right? And uh, it's been very progressive in terms of its uh, leadership. Staff has had hired good staff, and, and staff have done their job. So it, it's a combination of factors that, uh, and I think they have a sense of purpose. You know, it's like when you're marching an army into war, they have to know what they're marching for. Um, and I think the CSCA leaders and, and staff and, and the members understand what they're fighting for. Are there any uh, major uh, events and uh, actions that, uh, that we missed in this uh, conversation? Oh. That uh, I'll tell you, it, you know, when I think about it, I've been working for the union movement now more than 31 years. And, and uh, when you look back, you say, well, those are great years. When you live them, they could be tough years. I mean, when we, as I said, when we started out, it was, um, we were an independent, we were being raided. So part of the marching orders were that, you know, you wine and dine and you develop relationships with all the leaders out there. So I would be out every night. I mean, it was interesting. When I worked in the field, I would be out every night, many times to 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, um, either negotiating contracts or going to a school board meeting or you know, whining and dining a local or unit president. Uh, didn't work a lot of weekends. At that time, you know, we didn't have a, a very extensive training program. Uh, we'd only work weekends if there was like a strike. There weren't that many membership meetings on a weekend. Um, and then when you go to headquarters, it's the exact opposite. You know, you, you have a more defined work schedule during the week, and you, you know, you can get home at 6, 7 o'clock. A lot more weekend work because you're going out to, to different meetings. So it was, it was really tough, uh, you know, if you had a young family. You know, if you look back at the, uh, uh, the history of leadership and staff, I mean, there's probably a lot of alcoholism, a lot of, you know, broken marriages, and it, it, it's a mentally, you got to be mentally committed to do this, um, and some people handle it well and some don't, um, but it was, it was tough. You had young kids, you know, you, you didn't see them as much as you wanted to, but you, know, you have to do what you got to do. Sure. Anything else you'd like to add, or? I have to go back into my uh, my files and see. There's all, I mean, there's such great stories. Uh, <laughs> some of them you'd have to change the names to protect the guilty, and uh, some are probably uh, some illegal things went on. But uh, I think I'll save those for my memoirs. <laughs>